Yeah, so over the last decade or so, uh, wealth has been created between multi-generational multi -generational business families and a whole lot of new money that's come into India. This, of course, has been in the form of startup founders, uh, first-generation entrepreneurs, and C-suite executives. And as a boutique wealth advisory firm, a lot of our clients rely on us uh, to work with them on important and deeply personal uh, issues around their financial well-being. Today's conversation is centered around what it really takes to build a brand, not just for affluent Indians, but I'd imagine for the world, for global citizens. And I'm guessing all the three gentlemen here would have global aspirations, to say the least. Uh, so without wasting any more time, let's quickly jump in and get to know these three men better. I'm going to start with uh, you, Gotham, on that edge. Gotham, to begin with, uh, you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself. I'm sure the audience really wants to know what your journey has been like. You, at some stage, were working for somebody else. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. And when did this journey begin? When did you decide you want to be an entrepreneur and get into retail? Luxury retail, if I can call it that. Or maybe not. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> like, All summed uh, up into one. Uh, didn't really plan to make a brand, per se. It was just to earn money at that point of time. You know, I was on a crossroad of sorts in my life and wanted to do something which is a lot more creative. When you're working with someone else, you're always doing something which is a morphed version of what you want to make and what the actual aspirations are and what the budget is. And, uh, you know, got tired of it after a while. Like, it, it, it was, I think, two or three years that I was working in this company, which was uh, mainly dealing with Scandinavian countries like Denmark, Norway, and I was doing a lot of design for them. So and it was always retail? Sorry? It was retail? It was retail. Okay. Yeah. And uh, mainly apparel and fashion. And um, after a while, I just got tired of it and thought, like, I need to do something of my own and uh, I wasn't making too much money. And uh, I was like, how do I crack this? And um, started in Apadori in uh, 2010, and um, had no plan as such, in terms of, uh, you know, ignorance is bliss. Yeah. So for me, like, it was more or less, okay, I want to start a brand, let's name a brand, and let's get a store and start. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to pitch to these stores, and I'm going to get my product into the right stores first experiment with the market, see if it's working out or not. I just went all in with it and uh, hopefully, like, it, thank God it worked. And um, the response was amazing. Like, uh, I know that I was, it, from the get-go, at a premium segment, like, I was designing bags, which are canvas bags, but they were priced at a pretty decent price time, at that yeah. point of time. And um, a lot of people did come to me and say, oh, I can buy this in XYZ brand, yeah. full leather, and you're giving me something with leather in canvas, and why is it so expensive? And I'm like, because you're paying for the design as well. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. that's something which the Indian audience didn't really get, that they have to pay for design yeah. and the product. And, uh, and a new brand. And the brand, well, there wasn't any brand. I was <laughs> starting off at that point of time. Uh, but then you have to stick to your guns, is, is the thing, you know? Like, I, I, from the get-go, knew in terms of uh, the market segment that I wanted to tap into. And there wasn't that market segment at that point of time, so I had to create it. Yeah. And, uh, and you don't create something like that in, like, two months. You know, it takes time. Yeah. And uh, I'm still trying to create it. And... Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's been a pretty interesting journey from there on, you know, like we've obviously expanded now and we have like... I heard about a store in London, is that happening anytime soon? Yeah, London's uh, operational for the last four or five years now, uh, we're in Covent Garden and uh, we just opened Dubai and, um, and yeah, aspirations are to obviously open more international locations along with India and there's always going to be a very important market for us. And so 12 years, how many stores across the world? Uh, well, two at this point, <laughs> two outside the country, but about eight locations here, and we're opening about three more um, soon in a couple of months. It's exciting. Nibran, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, from New York to Bombay, oh, real estate, no, banking to real estate. How and where was Esprava born? So, can everyone hear me? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking, thank you. Yeah. It makes me feel great. <laughs> Good. Uh, so I was an investment banker. I was in New York, London, hated it, 
uh, always wanted to come back, so came back in 2010, uh, started uh, a healthy snacking company called Snackable. Maybe some of y'all have tried it. Uh, we just closed around, so uh, y'all will hear about it soon. I uh, went to Goa on a holiday, uh, wanted to buy a home, didn't like anything, decided to build a home. Halfway through, couldn't uh, afford it, took a loan, sold the home, got lucky, and then thought, okay, maybe this can be a business. And that's how I started. So I don't know real estate. I mean, I do now, don't worry. <laughs> but I did not know real estate back then. Uh, and now we have two companies, Isprava and Lohono. Yeah. Isprava, we build and develop homes. Uh, Lohono is an exclusive Rental. platform to uh, rent And the homes. revenues are split equally between Lohono and No, Isprava Prava? is much larger, uh, oh, obviously. Is. But uh, So Lohono, we have, uh, I think, 450 homes on our platform across six countries. Um, and Isprava is, I mean, we built in Goa, Alibag outside Mumbai in Tamil Nadu. I think most of us here have been to lots of Isprava properties. <laughs> I, I hope so. Uh, Waterfield, I'll give your clients a discount. When <laughs> you promise us that. This is on stage, guys. Don't forget. <laughs> we, we've had 2020, 2010, and your 2018 is when you started the Quorum Club. I started this... Isprava actually in 2016. For six years, I fooled around. Ah, okay. <laughs> so where did the 2010 come from? You moved back I to moved Bombay back then, in 2010. Yeah, yeah. Right. Vivek, you want to come on this one? What about your journey? You've moved to Goa now. Has this Prava done up your home? No, not no. Yet. We haven't. You met. guys can't be friends. No, we're, <laughs> we're going to see each other next week. But uh, uh, no, listen. Um, similar to everyone else's, you know, you get to a crossroad in your life, where, um, in my case, I was unemployable, so I was forced into entrepreneurship, and um, and uh, the journey actually started in 2015. The idea of um, um, you know, I was a banker that got into hospitality by chance. I did a transaction in the hospitality space. And, um, and really, that's how I got into hospitality. So not from an operational perspective, but more from an investment perspective. Um, and then through that platform that I worked for, got exposed to um, this private members club space that was mushrooming around the world. Um, and kind of no one had done it in India. And I think a lot of people had ideas. And for everyone I spoke to said, we want to do a private members yeah, club. Yeah, yeah. But I think I was, the, I was just foolish enough to do it. Um, you know, and uh, um, so 2015 um, started, a um, couple of false starts. Uh, you know, it's a, it was a fairly big undertaking for, for the capital one had. So one had to um, you know, sell a dream. Um, and I guess the banking uh, industry always helps because you know, we're, we're very good salespeople. Uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, a you know, couple of false starts. And 2018 is when we opened the Quorum in Gurgaon. Yeah. And 2021, we opened our second club in Mumbai. And um, I hope 2023, well, not I hope, but 2023, we'll open our third one in, in Hyderabad. And, uh, and then um, hopefully, you know, upwards and onwards from there. Yeah, so. Very exciting. Gautam, I'm going to come back to you on this one because we did start talking about how your audience or your customer base was questioning the premium that you were charging in the early days. Uh, I talked about how the last decade or so has seen a change of color in, in, of money, if I can say that right. Um, have you seen your customer profile actually go through a change, a significant change? Because now you are seeing a whole lot of second gen first generation entrepreneurs, startup founders, like I mentioned. A lot of affluent Indians are moving back to India. Has that base changed? Are you, are you sensing a change? Do you anticipate a change? Well, for sure, there's a massive shift in, in this uh, aspect. You know, for me as a brand, I couldn't sustain myself if the audience wasn't there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think the younger generation is a lot more prouder to be from India, by Indian, and that's a massive change that we've seen. Um, earlier, 10 years back, even, yeah, hardly 10 years back, if you went into the market, everyone was like, oh, I got this from London, and I got this from Paris, and blah, blah, and you know, no one's buying Indian. And, but now the younger generation is actually proud, uh, self-conscious, and at the same time, they are happy to carry Indian made outside the country and show it off. You know, like, and that's a massive change that's happened. And I think that's uh, given us a platform to actually thrive. So and do you attribute this to the brand that you've created or to the change in the kind of wealth that has been created in the country? I think a bit of both, because the people who are buying it are not fools. You know, like yeah, they, yeah. They're, they're well-traveled. They know exactly There's what they awareness, want. Yeah. 
And at the same time, you know, you can't fool them. You can't just like give them a me mediocre product and say that, okay, you know, take it because it's made in India. Yeah. You know, that can't happen. Those days are gone, you know, like, and, and now, you know, obviously the brand and the product needs to talk as much as the yeah. fact that you're talking as much yeah, as yeah. being from where you are. Yeah. I'm gonna talk about the pandemic a little bit because I think that's had opposite effects on Nibranth and Vivek's business. Nibrant, I think the last two years saw a whole lot of local travel pick up. I mean, we were all visiting locally much more than international travel because that clearly wasn't an option. How did that work out for you? Look, it worked well. I mean, Alibag is now being called the Hamptons of Bombay, right? So, yeah. and that's where Sprava really is. <laughs> no, so I think, here's what, I think you're right, domestic travel opened up, I think people discovered spaces. For us, it was helpful because we, we aren't hotels, right? We're yeah. fragmented individual yeah. villas, yeah. at least on the rental side. And, and uh, what that's done is actually open up this huge addressable market because before that, you know, uh, most people are quite insecure, right? We, we don't follow a flag like the Chinese, but we're insecure, right? And, and that's why we went to hotels because yeah. there's a high level of standardization, high level of security. You know, if you go to a Taj in Kashmir or Kanyakumari, the namaste is the same, right? And, and then suddenly you were forced to go to these homes. And as long as we could give some level of standardization and some level of consistency, it makes sense. You can, yeah. you know, A, go as a group. Indians travel in groups. We don't travel as a nuclear couple like Westerners do. Yeah. Uh, we don't like rules. We've all negotiated the buffet guy yeah. at 10 in the morning or, or the checkout guy at 12. And here you That's can That's got to be done. <laughs> yeah. And, and here you can s swim at midnight or eat breakfast at 5 in the afternoon. And, 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 but you also need service, right? And that's why, you know, the typical peer-to-peers don't work because we need service. Yeah. And, and, and so now people hopefully realize that there's an opportunity to, you know, live in homes that give you some sort of standardization some sort of good service, good product, and, and you know, long may it continue. And that's a huge change as well, right? Because if you did this maybe 10, 15 years ago, when I think the older wealth was so focused on luxury hotels or five-star hotels, because that's what you ever thought of, uh, that, has that changed for you? Do you think your customer base has changed because of the new wealth that this country has seen? Yeah, I think it's two things, right? I think number one, the internet. Uh, yeah. You know, back in I the day, Airbnb the older guy well was driving down the highway well. and if he saw an unbranded hotel, he could get killed yeah. if he went in there, right? So he went to the brand. Uh, now the bloggers and yeah. trip advisor and ratings and feedback. So, so you can be more adventurous, but you're right. I think, you know, the below 40s are a lot more adventurous. You want something unique. You want something private. You want something Instagrammable. Uh, and, 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 and that works, right? And that's why homes work, villas work, because it's different from your friend who went to yeah. a hotel. Fair. Vivek, uh, what about you? The pandemic, I'm guessing, had an impact. You s started shop 2018. We got hit in 2019, end of the year. 2020, actually, Business yeah. Business shut down to some extent. Uh, how are things now? And how did that impact uh, work for you? Yeah, so listen, hospitality got pretty badly slammed um, <clears throat> initially. Um, but I think we came out of it uh, relatively quicker and faster than most. And I think one couple of reasons was because we were a a gated private community of sorts. I think when people started to come out and everyone wanted to come out, they felt a little safer here. Um, obviously, we were able to also, um, you know, put the rules in place and enforce the rules because we were a, we were closed knit yeah. environment. So I think people took a lot. In fact, a lot of people their first um, sort of visit outside of their homes post the pandemic, when the lockdowns got lifted, was to the quorum. Um, so I think that was, so we, we kind of bounced back first and then obviously people hadn't spent for a couple of months so they were quite happy to, uh, you know, <laughs> buy that bottle of single malt that they, they probably would have thought twice about. But that was one part of it. I think there was a larger shift that happened slightly over time and that is that I think um, we always designed the, the quorum and the place as this third space, right? It's a place away from work, it's a place away from your home, uh, it's this lifestyle third space and I think the the value of that third space became more apparent to the consumer post the pandemic. They're like, I need a place like this. So I think from a, a, you know, I think our brand was also just coming out, getting known, and then the pandemic was a positive push towards people saying, hey, I need a place like this where, you know, people. there's predictability. 
um, in the space. Uh, I can work there, I can work out there, I can get a little bit of cultural nourishment through sort of our programming that we do and, uh, and a good dining program. You know that there is some level of predictability in it. So, um, so I, 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 on, on, on balance, uh, I think it kind of uh, positively impacted us. And, and then, you know, with most people, I think, and this is true, in, in the initial period of time, uh, everyone went back to the basics and said, hey, how do I cut costs? And I think that was a great learning for all entrepreneurs. Like, and, and I think those were um, structural changes we made to our cost structures that I think still remain. Uh, so that, that brought in forced discipline yeah. in the way we ran our business, at least in the hospitality space. I don't know whether you guys felt that as well. But, uh, uh, but yeah, uh, I think on, on balance, we, uh, in hindsight, I think it, it, it was a... It was more of a net positive than a negative for us. And I think one other thing that could potentially have worked for you guys is through the pandemic, most of us hung out with our neighbors. It was almost a bit of a community feeling, like-minded. And I think that's what you're going after, right? Creating a community of like-minded people. How has that journey been? Because I know Indians also stick in clicks. So this may or may not work for you. So listen, the, it's the very thesis of why um, I felt there was a need for a space like the Quorum. I, I'm a fairly outgoing person. A lot of these folks here are, are, are members of ours, so, and, and they kind of know that. So, and I, through the many years of you know, being around, uh, met new people all the time. And I've, I've found that a lot of people, interesting people, didn't know each other. And I think we get stuck in silos. We get stuck in our work silos. We get stuck in our family silos. We get stuck in our, in our um, you know, if you have kids, you know, their friends, you know, their parents, that kind of silo. And I think a lot of people get so tied up in that they don't find a natural platform to meet like-minded people. So I thought there was always this gap there. So, um, so we set up a space that, uh, and, and you know, we, we looked to curate a community around ideas, mm. um, and, um, and it became self-serving in a, in, a, in a certain way. And then, and then once you, so the initial part is really difficult, but I think once you get to this critical mass, the base feeds itself. Uh, and now, now we've seen it. I think we're, we're, we're uh, between both our cities. We have almost 2,400 members, and um, it's um, it's interesting. I'm seeing a lot of them get to know each other that didn't know each other, and for us, that's really rewarding uh, because um, uh, you know, to me, that's really why we set up the business. Uh, and if we could do that successfully, I think you have longevity in our business, at least. Yeah. And especially because it's subscription at the end of the day, right? You've got to have people you know, find you value can sell, and stay. You can sell <laughs> membership to anyone. You have a renewal rate. Yeah. We have 97% <laughs> renewal rate of membership. And that's, that's really, credible. that is the actual... Commendable. Uh, yeah, You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Benchmark, yeah. I think it's repeat membership that makes all the difference. Yeah. Uh, talking about growth and personalization, uh, Nibrand, I'm going to come to you on this one. Your product is standardized but personalized. As you look to scale, which is what you're thinking, how tough do you think it's going to be? Is it going to be a challenge? Because you can only scale niche to that extent, right? And uh, of course, pricing is important too, yeah? Agreed. So let's take both businesses, right? So Isprava is where we build the homes. Uh, they, each home is unique, and it has to be unique. I mean, when you're selling a 10, 20, 30, 40 crore home, it has to be But you can still spot an Isprava from a distance, right? It's got, you, you have your touch. In I think Goa. Soumya and the audience would agree. <laughs> <laughs> Soumya's is the best. Yeah. But, uh, no, so, yeah, but they have to be different. And uh, that's what we aim to do. And, and, and we do it in different ways. Uh, the way you can scale that is through technology, through systems processes, which is what we do. Uh, over time, however, we're a luxury company. And over time, our prices go up. And every year, year on year, they go up. Uh, and that, you know, that allows the brand to stay elevated and, and, and doesn't cannibalize itself. Uh, and, and then you have Lohono. And Lohono, I mean, each product is different anyway, right? Like we have Jack Ma's home on our platform. Yeah. We have the Altani Royal Family home on our platform. They're, they're completely different, different from each yeah. other, but they're all beautiful. So that you can, you know... Keep different. Keep different. And, and keep the identity. This, as long as it's yeah. standard. So... You know, even if you go to a home of ours in Phuket, right, there's the, the, the type of service you get there will be very similar to Goa. Even the type of food, by the way, Indians love. I mean, you want to yeah. wake up and have a paratha in Phuket, and you'll get dosa, it. Yeah? You, you, you'll get it. And, and that's kind of how we've thought about it. So it is largely catered to Indians, even internationally then? 100%. 2019 had 40 million outbound Indian travelers, right? So if you cut it all down and cut it down to the luxury leisure traveler, that's still a massive addressable market. And that's what we're going, going for. Uh, yeah. you know, so we do have clients from around the world. 
uh, but what we're catering to is the rich Indian, Indian who like how travels you say, around rich the world. Indian. Yeah. Not mincing your words. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Yeah, yeah, this is luxury. There is a fee yeah. and there's a, yeah. No, I can't afford a house, <laughs> for sure. Well, he's building his house. Not his client. You, you could be next. You can go rent. <laughs> She's done a sale for me. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> Too much pressure. Uh, Gautam, so you're in the retail space. Fashion changes every day. We all have classics and we're all willing to spend big bucks on classics and I think most people in the audience probably go on to a trip in London and Paris and talk about the queue at Chanel was so long because they went to pick up a classic. How does that work for your business? How much do you have to be on your feet all the time reinventing yourself? It's strange that you ask that because last night I was talking to someone I was saying this constant search for newness yeah. is like completely draining me. Um, and you still have to maintain your brand exhausting. and stay the same. Yeah, and uh, for us, it kind of it's it's kind of worked well because we usually do timeless classic pieces, as you said. Yeah. Um, and even f with my team and everyone, I have to always tell my team, guys, you know, I know you want to do the most trendiest bag in town, but stick to the basics, stick to the classics because those are the ones that are going to keep coming back. Repeat customers. And you know, you don't, you don't build brands on trend, trends. If, you, if that's your formula, you're going to fail. Yeah. You know, you have to have something which has a legs and which has a, a certain amount of nostalgia and certain amount of uh, emotional connect with the audience and with your clientele. And, uh, and that can be built with the, not only the product, but even the type of service that you end experience. up getting. Experience. Experience. And experience retail is where the world's going to. Yeah. And uh, we had to, you know, also kind of evolve and uh, look at other avenues and look at other ways where we can keep and uh, keep the audience engaged. If, the bottom line is, if someone walks into a Napa Dori store, how do we keep them more than 15 seconds and you know make them spend some more time it's not about a point of sale yeah, it's yeah. a point of experience for us and that's key in terms of how to retain your customer and uh, and hence we had to open cafe dory we we did that we ha we created a space where someone could come and enjoy themselves someone where someone could get a little more you know, inspired, get your creative juices going, you know, have a nice cup of coffee, smell the, you know, ambience, and just look at people watch. You don't need to go and buy a product, you know, just you can just go out. back. Yeah. And uh, because I know that's going to convert at some point of time. So it's really important. So, uh, you so I, I bought a Napadori suitcase. I traveled 20 days a month. I get stopped at every airport. Really? I'm not it's even a good kidding. Good-looking bag, huh? I get stopped at every so, but you, you owe me a commission for <laughs> <No>. that. <laughs> Everyone every here airport, is selling. <laughs> every airport I get stopped. Where to get that bag from? That's so, brilliant. Gautam, I'm doing, I'm doing my bit to, uh, to promote you. Yeah. Uh, great, great, classic. That, that's what it yeah. is. Yeah. We're getting a larger size than the same one, by the way. <laughs> you can gift it to Vivek. <laughs> right. But uh, just help me understand this better, Gautam. So this is what. It's all about the experience, like you said. It's about having that coffee, and then, of course, window shopping, which will eventually convert into a sale or a purchase at a later stage. Is that the same thing internationally, or is this a marketing strategy or a sales strategy which is India-focused? Not that, at all. It's internationally it's, it's as well. It's, it's everywhere. Like, people and their attention spans is really, really light at this point of time. You know, they don't, they don't really stick to anything. It's Insta world. So everyone's like, you know, you have to just keep moving forward and you don't even go to a museum and look at a painting or you were going to go to a store and look at a bag and yeah. it's not going to happen. And, uh, it, but what you need to, you know, obviously be mindful of is the fact that you're creating a product that has to be palatable everywhere. So you're not creating something just for India or just for London or just for Dubai. And I get this question quite a lot that, oh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, because at, at the end of the day, I've, got, I've actually got this question so many times that, oh, you opened a store in London, is the collection different? And I'm like, no, it's not, it's the same thing because, you know, at the end of the day, you have to have a, you know, a global standardized, standard, standardized LA, international palette, you know, like something that kind of works with everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's where, at least for us, the classics come into play because that everyone can understand. Yeah, and you're also playing that segment which is between very luxurious mm -hmm. 
and not so luxurious, right? So it's True. right in between, it's affordable, it's still some sort of luxury, there is repeat value, it is still a classic, and I think all of that and the experience uh, plays out quite well. One more question to you, Gotham, because I think this is what we talked about a lot in the last six to eight months. The pandemic gave birth to a whole lot of new retail brands in India. Instagram should be given all the credit for you know, helping a lot of these local brands pick up business. One reason being we were restricted from travel. And second, of course, you started looking more inward, a little bit like what happened with the Sprawa. Do you see that changing? Do you see that the, the money is now going back out to other brands or you're not facing the competition just yet? Yeah, I was surprised that you didn't ask me the earlier question. Like, <laughs> how was my pandemic? Yeah, yeah pandemic. <laughs> so like, because it my business, out really well. My business came to zero like oh, for did, two yeah. years because who was buying laptop bags when they're all sitting at home? Yeah, you yeah, know, Or yeah, any yeah. sort of bag. So for us, we had to reinvent and we had to actually think, come back to the drawing board and say, what do we do? What do we sell? And that's the time we created Dory Living, which is our home extension because everyone was home. So we had to do something. And uh, we came, within six months, we churned out a full product line and uh, anything that was uh, desk friendly or a workspace, home workspace friendly, we had to design all that. And uh, we actually have Dory Living out here in Quorum, by the way. So I'm just, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I had to tell the team that the entire world's going online. Yeah. Everyone wants to have an online shop, but tactile retail is not going to go anywhere. You know, actually, you're making a physical product. It needs a physical space, and someone needs to come and touch it and feel it. Feel it that, yeah. that, that journey has to be there and will not go away. You know, for, for people to experience, everyone can't sit at home and shop. So, and, and that's what the entire conversation was within the company. Like, what do we do? You know, we had to shut three stores. We couldn't afford the rentals, oh. we couldn't do anything, and we were almost bankrupt. We didn't know what to do, you know, how long is this going to be? Yeah. So, as Vivek had mentioned earlier, you know, you have to, like, cut the fat and be lean. And, uh, and, and those kind of standards are moving forward. It's actually helped us in identifying the stores which are not profitable or what will, which, were, which had a lot more emotional value. Yeah. Like, I didn't want to shut my first no, store of course ever. not, yeah. And, uh, you know, it was really hard. But then again, you move on, you evolve, and you, you know, keep going on. And, uh, and to your question in terms of is the world going back to not buying the bank brands that were born during the uh, pandemic? I mean, what? we're back to facing international competition. Right? We're all back to traveling. Uh, there are more than one options available now. So I'm guessing the fight's gotten tougher? For sure. And Everyone's coping us. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so like, obviously, fight's gotten tougher. Uh, and it's cheaper. And, uh, but then you keep evolving. That's what I yeah. said, like, you know, you have to be constantly evolving. You can't, no one can copy your brain, right? So like, you have to be two steps ahead. How many designers do you have? Trick one. question. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, Just like, you? Yeah, I have two interns. That's it. We're looking for designers, by the way. So there well. you go. This is <laughs> a pitch, a pitch stage. <laughs> so. We're selling homes, we're selling jobs, core membership. I'm selling nothing. Oh. Nibrantha. So I'm going to come back to this question. We, we'll talk about branding because I think that's uh, the center of today's conversation. How critical do you think uh, your brand is? So what I really want to understand is, did the product create the brand or did the brand create the product, if you know what I'm trying to get at, right? Because there's so much euphoria that gets created and then one follows the other usually. No, the, the brand fundamentally is the product. Right? You, can, you can create moats around it. You can you know, do the fancy stuff and you can, but if the actual product isn't great, no one's gonna buy it. There'll be no repeat value. Yeah, they won't buy it in the first yeah. place, right? And so the way we thought about the business, and, and if you look at Isprava, the way we thought about the business is look, it's a real estate company, fundamentally. Real estate companies suck. So what, you know, where do we kill friction every step of the way? So number one, let's follow every law in the land. Let's deliver homes before time. Okay. You know, these are basic tenets of our brand, right? Nothing else matters. Your brochure can be fancy, but if I deliver you a home three months later, I'm not going to win. Yeah. I'm going to lose. So deliver before time. It should work well. It shouldn't leak. You know, all that other good stuff. Of course, it should look beautiful, but beauty is subjective. Yeah. Uh, and then you create the other stuff. Then you create the modes around you know, we fully furnish it or we manage it for you or then we put it on a platform so it's no longer 
a cost center, but a profit center because we rent it out, etc. But we could do all that, and if the home wasn't nice, and mm -hmm. if it didn't work or we delivered it late, we wouldn't win. How many homes have you done so far? Uh, we've delivered about uh, 200 odd, but we have about 600 odd under construction. That's a beautiful inventory. Vivek, what about you? We talked about this before the event started, and I was trying to understand from you, uh, is this niche, is this luxury? And you said, I don't like the word luxury. I don't like the word exclusive. Uh, what are we trying to create here? Well, it's all about like-minded people, but there's got to be a bit of a pull factor, right? How important do you think this is in your business? Because while we talked about Annabelle's and Soho House, they did exactly that. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say I didn't like, I, I don't understand the word luxury, personally. It's a, it's a personal kind of a thing, or, or I struggle with the word exclusivity. No, Brian's uh, not getting upset. I, uh, <laughs> you know what, I... Yeah. yeah go I, on, I, no, go on. Because I, it means different I, 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 Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm, I don't, yeah. my personal life is not yeah. luxury. You know, yeah, just no, watches in mind, I was telling yeah. someone. So, you know, Suneva is, you know, uh, what do they call it? Barefoot luxury. I mean, so, you know, there are many people. It's very subjective. Yeah, so listen, I think, um, I think fundamentally, um, product, and as Nibran said, design is subjective. Um, we may think this looks nice, you know, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, they'll have different viewpoints of that. But I think um, building, a, building the space is one part of it. We always felt that uh, engaging it with great ideas and content was going to be a differentiator. And uh, this is not something that we came and thought about later. When we designed the space, we thought about the lighting, we thought about the acoustic. We actually saw how we wanted to transform the place from a place to socialize and work and have business meetings in the daytime to a place that converted into a jazz or an opera space in the evening. So this is not something that bothered me, we thought, like, you know, let's also do this. So I think that, that, that's something that, that, that was unique to what, what we've done. And, um, you know, um, I saw Rohit here, but uh, Saloni, who helped us create this, the programming, you know, and, and, and I think everyone who's experienced Quorum, uh, that's really what our, what our differentiator is. And it, it, it sort of talks to your point about experiential. Yeah. Uh, so I think luxury is about experience now. Um, and I think that's the currency that people are looking for. And, um, and I think the, the programming that we did also helped us create this community because it was a self-selective bias of people who were interested in things that we were doing. So that's what we attracted. So it kind of, it had this multi-layered impact on, on what we did. Uh, so it was not about money. Yeah. It wasn't about, you know, our price point is not something that it's, you have to be, to be living doing. in uh, Orange Air Road uh, to afford the core membership. But it's a certain sensibility uh, is that is, uh, and, and it was defined by what we stood for, what we did, and, uh, you know, what kind of thought leadership and culture we brought through our platform. And that's really very much been our focus and will continue to be our focus as we grow our business. Right. Uh, for the benefit of the other entrepreneurs in the room, uh, can you help us understand when should a business look global? And all three of you are global in some form or the other. Is there a right time? Is there a right feeling? Is there a right market? Uh, do you want to start, Gotham? Oh, right time, right market. I won't uh, define it like that. I just feel that as as your core DNA, what do you want? What do you aspire to be? You can start with going global. You don't need to be in India. You know, nowadays you can start a company anywhere. Uh, I just feel uh, you need to gauge the market well. You need to understand what your audience is and where your audience is, yeah. and then tap into those markets. You know, and and it's very subjective to every business. You know, he might have a completely different say on it, and Vivek yeah. would have as well. So uh, for us, uh, I think the time was now in terms of after ten years of being in the business, in the business, having a brand. Uh, we thought, okay, now is the time, we need to get out, we need to start uh, catering, because we saw the movement as well, we saw the type of audience we were, you know, attracting, mm. and uh, we were like, okay, this is a big market, and obviously the sensibility is kind of over in general uh, yeah. with a much larger aud audience, you know, out here is a very niche audience to what we cater to, and over there everyone gets it in, yeah. that, in, in that instant, and so it, it just made commercial sense to uh, set up shop outside. Nibrantha, when do you think one should leverage a local brand and go global? 
You know, I don't have an answer to that. I'll, I'll tell you why we went global, right? We went global with Lohono when we started. So we launched in November 2019 uh, in India, and we launched uh, Bali and two locations in Thailand, Koh Samui and Phuket, in December 2019. Yeah, straight up. And, and, and the reason we did that was because our average ticket size, the customer who paid our average ticket size, traveled on travel. average, six, did six holidays a year, but five of them was outside India. Yeah. So I had to you take had to my source market and be was. there with them. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is increase my repeat cohort. So if you spend you know, January in Kasoli with us, great. Spend but, but spend May in yeah. Bali with us, right? Don't, don't leave us, don't leave our platform. And that's why we did that. Isprava, we aren't international. We might be next year, yeah. but you know, or we might but never be. if an opportunity be. shows up, you'll be there, right? Maybe, but we don't need to be. Yeah. Vic, what about you? Yeah. How are you playing the global game? You know, first of all, I think we've, we're, we're trying to create a community of sort of global Indians, what we call it. You know, those people who are well-traveled and, you know, have, and I, I like to believe the space has a global sensibility to it. Um, we have 50 affiliation clubs around the world. Um, but as far as we going, uh, ourselves quorum opening another market, never say never, but I don't see it uh, on the cards yet. I think, um, I, think there's, I think there's a lot to do here. And if you have a couple of big rounds of funding coming your way. Huh? Yeah, I just don't see where's, uh, I think, you know, we've got to focus on, like I said, you never say never, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But where I see it today is that if we can grow to six, seven cities and have 10, 15,000 of the most interesting, upcoming, aspirational, global-minded Indians as our, as our our member base, I think that's worth its weight in gold and that should be our focus. And then that becomes a great platform for the advocacy of ideas, conversations like this. For the advocacy of brands, we've got Gotham you know, retailing in our space. So we become this interesting platform for creating brand experiences um, it through, through, because we've got the audience and, and the space. So I, I think for now, our focus will remain here. Uh, but you know, who knows? Uh, you know, if, uh, if a big check comes its way, I don't see the, but I really don't see the, I don't Need see the edge it. we bring in our business yeah. in a foreign market. I, I don't no, and see it's it. all about like-minded people anyway, right? So if that's the community you're going with, you know, we get a lot of uh, our foreign um, through our reciprocal club. A lot of our, um, our members who uh, or members of our reciprocal clubs come and visit us here. And they're all like, oh my God, we can't believe we're in India and like this place is so good. So we see a lot of them coming here and for us, that's the global connect today. Mm. Uh, and I, I don't know if it stays that way, but for me, in my, in my viewpoint, I don't see it changing for, for some time. Right, so those are a whole bunch of questions that I've covered. Uh, you guys have any questions for each other? Please feel free on this podium. But I'm just gonna open the floor up for questions from the audience and yeah, if anyone's got questions for Gotham, Nibran, yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, can we just wait for the mic? I can hear him, by the way. Hi, Gautam. Uh, good evening. I have a question for you specifically. When does a luxury brand become an aspirational luxury brand? You know, when, when do people start aspiring that I should really have this bag or this wallet or this, you know, book cover, anything, you know? Uh, it, it, you have a brand which is obviously a good product, but when, when do you reach a stage and how do you reach a stage when it becomes an aspirational value that I'm going to close this thing, uh, you know, I, I have a certain milestone that I cover, uh, whether it's a business transaction or a certain point, and I need to buy this. Am I able to explain myself? No, I, I, I get what you saying, but like for me, it's, it, it's a very tricky question to answer because at the same time, you know, and at least for brands, I think a lot of people just think that, okay, I'm going to create a brand and uh, everyone's going to come buy it. You know, like I think you need time to grow. Aspirational brand, I feel, comes with time. Like, you know, you need time to create brands. A lot of people come and say, oh, like you have a leather goods company and, you know, are you trying to be uh, Louis Vuitton or are you trying to be someone? And I'm like, what are you even talking about? You know, like at the end of the day, those, India is 75 years old. Those brands are like 200 years old. You know, like it takes time for, for it to get registered in someone's head. It takes time for people to understand the brand ethos, you know, and, and, and it could be aspirational for uh, X person, it won't be aspirational for someone else. So it's also subjective to the person. You know, like we are obviously trying to create and obviously set our mark in a certain segment of the retail chain and maybe premium or bridge to luxury or 
uber luxury. And till the time you can define that and really conquer that segment for yourself, you'll be aspirational for someone. And you might not be aspirational for someone, like someone who buys yachts or her is villas. <laughs> might not want my back. You know, like, and it's all subjective. Thank you. Why not? I hope I could explain. Sorry? I'm saying why not? You need it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? There's one right there. All right. For all three of you. We can't hear you. Just one second. Hi, this is for all three of you. What is the biggest challenge that you think you'll face or you do face when it comes to trying to scale? Government. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm being honest. Yeah, that's, that's it, yeah. <laughs> for me at least. I think for me it's always been how do we not mess up the product? Because you know, sometimes uh, you get caught up chasing numbers, you get caught up you know, trying to hit targets. Uh, and you know, I, I actually learned it the hard way, actually the first villa ever. And, um, you know, I'm not a real estate guy. I don't come from a family of, you know, real estate guys. And uh, we messed up the roof in our house in Goa. And uh, the defect liability period got over, right? That's, you know, when you give free service back, it got over. And then the customer, this fancy Bollywood couple uh, said, listen, you got to fix it. You messed it up. And I, I said no the first time, but then I had an, an investor who told me that's the worst thing you can ever do. Uh, 20 years later, fix the damn roof because that's your brand. Um, and that's all great when things are going well. Um, so we do fix it 20 years later. Uh, but when things are going badly, uh, it, it's really, really important that, you know, that quality, that uh, honesty, right? Uh, it, it, it's, it's the DNA of your company, not only yours, but your managers and everyone under you. Yeah, I think uh, for me, uh, my biggest learning, I think, as an entrepreneur and as I scale up, I think is people. Uh, we're a very people-centric business. Um, we have almost 300 people now. And um, attracting, retaining, uh, and getting people fired up and for them to understand the DNA, what to do, I think that's, yeah. um, it's, it's a big part of my focus uh, as we grow. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's a challenge, but I would say I've spent 60% of my time uh, on people, uh, it's a big part of, for, for our industry. Awesome, thank you guys. Uh, yes, I think Nebrant, you touched upon it, but of course, as you scale, one of the biggest differentiators, how you differentiate from competitors is technology. And of course, the Quorum does a great job with the app that they've built, it's so interactive, and that's what engages you to come back. So I wanted to get your thoughts as well as to how exactly are you using technology to separate yourselves from competition? I think they're different in each business. So I'll start with the hospitality business because that's easier, right? We have a central OI on which everything sits. Uh, so uh, you have the revenue side, which is the booking app. You all should all download it. It's called Lohono Stays, uh, which we'll keep building out. You have the homeowner app. That means every property owner has an app with everything on it. His MIS, his, you know, his concierge, his, you know, whatever else. Uh, you have the guest app, which is being built as we speak. So again, you know, you'll have a whole load of things on it. Uh, so it's a front end, back end, the housekeeping app, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's all the engineering team, your tickets. It's, it's, it's all built on one OI, and they keep getting fed in, and we keep adding to it and making it smarter. Uh, and, and not only that, it's, you know, even for engineering, right? How do you do preventative maintenance? How do you do use, you know, machine learning to, to get that right? Uh, and then you have the real estate business. Now, the beauty of the real estate business is this. It is the only sector in the world where the product today is worse than 100 years ago. I would live in a how middle. So you don't have to do much to, to get it right. You just have to care a little, right, which no one does. Uh, so w when you talk about technology, the, I think the first thing is on the business side, you know, on the operation side and, you know, all that stuff which you have to do. Uh, you know, we have sales systems and operation systems and all that, you know, on apps and all that fancy stuff. Uh, but when it comes to new age technology for building, you know, we have two guys from IIT, Kharagpur, who lead our innovation cell. It's been a year. 
the old technology works much better. Uh, hopefully, we'll figure it out. So. It's true. IIT Kharagpur has an architecture degree. That's why, you know. It, it, but, but hopefully, it'll work soon. Uvek, what about you? I, I think he mentioned the core map. I mean, I, I'm glad he did. <laughs> I, I am, I'm uh, grateful that he did. But uh, listen, um, I think there's, for us, there's an opportunity to leverage technology better. Uh, I've got to be honest with you, I haven't figured it out yet. Um, I've been thinking about it, but we'll get to it at some stage. Uh, um, personally, you know, I like to see printed menus and order food and get service the old school way. Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, in, 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 in my mind, it's tough for me to, uh, you know, go completely digital. But I think there are certain areas where we can use technology better. Uh, we haven't done it well enough. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of areas of improvement and, um, yeah. Maybe we'll uh, find someone to come and help us build that at some stage. But it's sort of focus for me today. Gautam, what about you and your business tech? Yeah, I've been thinking about it like while they were talking that where do we stand in this aspect. And uh, for us, uh, you know, I've, I've even thought about, okay, what do we do? Uh, do we need to have a virtual store now? Because it's, you know, the meta was yeah. going to happen in the next five to six years, the, the retail segment's completely gonna change and how you're gonna interact with products, not just a website, virtually, but yeah. completely virtually immersing yourself. And um, I can't afford your houses, but I was thinking, should I buy a property in that sandbox, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and get, get something already <laughs> invested so that the property rates don't go up virtually. And uh, so it's, it's an interesting phase for brands in terms of how they're gonna morph into something uh, which is uh, pretty unknown for everyone. So uh, just to answer your question, like for us, it's, 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 it's a big question mark right now, but we are aware of it as, as a brand and we are obviously uh, a click away in terms of taking action when, as and when it happens and we know there's something tactile or something virtual which we, we, which we can tap into, you know? And uh, other than that, obviously tech in, variables and things like that we're already experimenting with. Hi, I have a question. See, I'm a Quorum member. I was one of the very few mem first members in Quorum. And I remember when we started coming to Quorum, uh, we used to watch Vivek the way he used to even clean e each and every leaf in this club. And we used to always used to go home and say, this is not a club, this is Vivek's home. Yeah. Over the year, we have, we have, I'm, we have, we come regularly here and we have started realizing this is our next home after our home. So we feel great coming here. The question to Vivek is because you have moved over to Mumbai and you're opening uh, uh, Hyderabad and then, uh, so, so how you're going to maintain, see, I have been, uh, I've been working on brands for the last four decades and built a lot of brands across the world. It's not easy to maintain a brand or have the consistency of the brand because you tend to lose and customers like us are very demanding. Today, when we walk into Kodam, we don't find a fault so that, because we meet Vivek, we say, hi, it's good, food is good, ambience is good, everything is nice. So, but the thing is, people like us are very demanding, not a single iota of problem or mistake. We will never leave Vivek, uh, uh, you know, uh, by saying that, oh, things are going bad. So, what it takes to maintain, <laughs> what it takes to maintain uh, such a product, which, and I'm really happy that you say you are not planning to go global, you want to be local or whatever it is. So, what, so how do you plan to take into so many cities and want to maintain that consistency so that a quorum member from Gurgaon goes to Mumbai, experiences the same feel and ambience and similarly in Hyderabad, some other places. Well, listen, first of all, thank you very much for, for your patronage and your support all these years. We're very grateful for that. And uh, um, so it, it's, it's, our, it, it's in any hospitality service business. That's the, it's, and I think I come back to people, uh, you know, and that's where my focus is. How do you distill the DNA uh, into the people that work for you so they see it in the way you do? And, I don't know if I have the answer for it today, but this is gonna be the, the biggest test as we scale up, is how do you keep that standard? And, uh, and yeah, I mean, a little, bit of a, a little bit of a stick and a little bit of a danda and a little bit of a kiss and a hug. I mean, that's a, it's a combination of all. Um, and I hope, you know, it's, it's attracting the right people who, and, and I guess inspiring them uh, to believe in, you know, what you do is slightly different and, and, um, uh, and yeah. 
Uh, but thanks, Manu. That's going to be our biggest learning as we grow, and I hope we're able to grow, uh, become stronger and better as we grow. But it, it's definitely going to be uh, something that we're going to figure out how we're going to resolve this challenge as, as we grow our business. And I don't think it's unique to us. I think any service-related business, hospitality, this is the biggest challenge. And you know, we have in, in our industry we have high attrition rates as well. So you have, you have people coming in and out all the time. So um, so yeah, 60% of my job is that uh, at the moment is that how do you keep that uh, standard going? And, and and I'm sure you let us know if we're doing a good job or not. Yeah. But but thanks for the. Thanks for the word of confidence thus far. You, you yeah. can't move to Goa. <laughs> <laughs> you stay here. The leaves need you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but Debran, you must face that too, right? As you look to scale, to ensure your brand is not being compromised. 100%. I think, look, again, in the development business, it's not that hard to do. Uh, you can do it in the hospitality business. We've done it differently. Um, you know, if you actually look at hospitality brands, they're highly standardized. Yeah. So they have SOPs for how to serve. And, how. and we've done it differently. So what we did is we've given you our team broad SOPs. There, and, and, and they're not, you know, it's not how to serve. It's just warm, proactive, yeah. reactive with examples. So, and, and, and then for each location, we've hired a head of guest relation, right? And then we rely on that person. And he or she can do whatever they want. So... As long as you know, those power. seven to nine core principles are followed, uh, and you know, otherwise you can do whatever you want. And that's kind of fun, right? So when you go, like I said, to our Kashmir uh, uh, home, our Srinagar home versus, say, a home in Goa, uh, there'll be some things that are standard. The bed sheets will be the same, or the shampoo will be the same, and the warmth will be the same. And, but there'll be some things that'll be completely different because, okay. the, because the leader there uh, is the owner. And uh, he or she lives by that guest NPS and the repeat cohort and all the other things you track. Gautam, do you face that challenge at all? Do you anticipate facing that as you expand? No, for sure. And uh, I think uh, consistency is the key yeah. to this. You know, at the end of the day, you need to maintain certain standards and you need to be consistent at it day in, day out. You know, and, and I unfortunately am trapped between two completely different businesses, which is hospitality and fashion. Because yeah. with the cafe Dory and, like, and I, consistency is like like that, yeah. you know, when it comes to F and B, because yeah. there's a certain amount of entitlement that people come in with, <laughs> you know, and they want their food a certain way, and it's it's difficult. And and I think uh, just till the time you you can deliver a quality product, and you know you co you're confident in delivering that, I think scaling up is easy. You know, and, and, and obviously the other basic hurdles which come in scaling up like money and I said government and yeah. all those things, you know, are there in the background, but they will always stay in the background. You know, they at the end of the day, the product needs to shine. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to add one thing. Um, it's also about the culture of the organization um, you build. Um, I think it goes a long way in attracting talent. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something I focus a lot about uh, on as well because... Uh, I think, a lot, I think we attract good talent in the industry because they want to work here. They, I think they're, they're treated fairly. It's a meritocracy-based sort of system. Uh, and they're doing interesting stuff that's outside of the traditional realm of hospitality. So I think that's another area where we focus on is, is how do we create and do things that keeps attracting the best talent in the industry. You know? And again, it's not easy, but it's something I think that makes a difference. Um, and you can build the fanciest restaurant and you know but you may not be able to retain the best chef and i've seen that in a lot of times so I, I don't think it's about money uh, people want to be inspired they want to work and do different things and i think as leaders of any business that's got to be the onus has to be on you uh, is to uh, is to inspire people to work for you and hopefully get the best out of them yeah. get the best out of them i think that's critical right i think you had a question yeah a question for all three of you uh, you all worked uh, before you started these ventures. So how much of your experience or in the pre-life to this venture of yours contributed to your success now? Uh, your learnings from your previous jobs or whatever you did? Because nowadays there is this trend of starting up as soon as you're out of school. So how important do you feel is some kind of experience in a, in a real life working for somebody help you and get to get you where you are today i think a lot i think uh, you know i think everyone should work uh they should work uh, 
for a significant period of time because you know you go through ups, you go through downs, uh, you learn best practices, you you know you learn how to start at the bottom because starting up means listen, I want to start at the top, right? And that's really easy to do, and it sounds sexy and it's fun, and you read it in the Economic Times and all that fun stuff. But the reality is, you know, unless the only way to learn to cycle is to practice, and you might as well practice on someone else's money before you know your own. So I think I would advise anyone to work, work, work in good places, work for a long period of time in the same place, uh, because then you can see cycles and uh, you learn that way. I completely endorse that because uh, I worked for a pretty significant time. Uh, didn't earn money, but a lot of experience. And uh, I just feel that it sets, you know, it gives you a certain amount of basic principles in terms of how life is and how things don't come easy and how you're answerable. And uh, I think a lot of uh, people who, and kids that I at least see coming from colleges have uh, no patience. And uh, they just want the job, they want a certain package, and if they don't, if someone else gives it to them, they'll just move on. You know, there's, a, there's no consistency in that. And, I've, I, and I just feel, you know, over the years when, when I was doing that, and uh, just the certain principles that have stuck from that time have really helped me in maintaining certain standards within the company as well, and I know where I'm going wrong with, with my employees as well. You know, I know I don't need to do that what I have experienced in the past. So those things have really helped and I think everyone should do it. You know, like everyone should get a job and, uh, and please don't, the startup thing has really spoiled that. You know, like everyone wants to have a startup and not a start, so. <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I mean, fully agree. The only sort of layer I would add to that is, um, it's not only the experience in life and work, but the relationships you build during that period for me, that's been the most uh, invaluable. When I started my business, I think, and I tell some of the young kids that work for me or work for us, I said, listen, if you do a good job, you've got this great platform, you've got great members who are super, um, you know, well to do in their own rights and very accomplished. I think if you do a good job and impress them well, tomorrow when you're in a position where you cross paths, if you've done a good job, that's what's going to serve you uh, well. So, because you never know in life, you've crossed paths with uh, different people. So I, I think it's not only the work, but also the, the, the relationships you build during that period that, uh, that I think are very helpful for you in your future as well. So, which you may not get if you go straight into a startup or... Um. We differentiated businesses, right from Napa Dori to Korum to Ispara. Um, and uh, my question really is, what did it take to stick to your gut? Because, you know, doing something which is already there is easier and you'll have hundred naysayers rather than, you know, people saying, okay, go for it. So, yeah, that's for all of you. Uh, for me, ignorance is bliss. You know, like, for the simple fact that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and I've built over the, over the, these last 10 years, I've, uh, it's been self-taught. I've learned certain things, you know, you know, you don't start a brand with a shop. Like, who, who does that? You know, things like that. I think um, it, it's, it's, it's a, Massive learning curve. I'm still learning. I'm still trying to evolve. I'm still trying to do things a bit different and uh, um, will fail, I know for sure, in a lot of aspects going forward. But I will succeed in a lot as well, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's sticking to your guns, at least for me. Um, yeah, I don't play poker, but I, I kind of did with my career. I went all in. Um, and then there was just no option. Uh, there was just no option uh, to, uh, and listen, we're not, we're not out there yet. I mean, we're still I mean, we're now starting to see a little bit of uh, success in our business. But uh, I think that conviction went from saying, hey, I'm not doing this peripherally, uh, to say, hey, I'll try this. It's not a side hustle. Um, you know, we, we had some, there's a very high level of conviction in what we did and, and, and really put all our chips into that. And I think that, I'll call it stupidity or not hedging your bets, as, as the bankers would say, but I think that's, that's something that, that's the approach we took, and um, yeah, time will see whether it, whether it pays back or not. Look, there'll always be naysayers. I think there are two parts to this. Uh, there'll be certain things that don't work, so don't be obsessed with that and be willing to let it go. Uh, and there'll be certain things that you truly believe, and it's your gut, and gut is actually muscle memory. It's not, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's much better than any research you can do. Uh, and, and, and if you think about us, right, and I'll, I, you know, 
when we started the business and we wanted to grow and you know, go to people, they said, oh, it's a niche business. How many homes are you going to sell in Goa? At the time, we were all, you know, how many homes are you going to sell in Goa? And I always had that strong belief that the way people live is going to change, right? Like, you only want to breathe so much Delhi air. And at some point, you are going to move out of the city. And, and the world will change, right? Hopefully, Goa will get schools and hospitals and roads and new airports, by the way, happening very soon. Uh, and, and so now it's no longer a niche business. Right now we're, by market cap, top 10 real estate company in India. And, and that's where we went all in. But then there are, there are a whole load of other things that we just said, look, cut it out, cut it out, cut it out, because we're failing there, you know, not getting obsessed with it. Well, I think uh, we're out of time now, but thank you very much. All of you have been a lovely audience, and thank you, Gautam, Vivek, and Nibrant. Uh, great chatting with you guys this evening, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.